Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Tuesday EMR with Robbie and the CPS Solver team. It's a really pleasure to have you all here with us. We are super happy. And uh, I want to announce that next week we are going to have our focus VMR back. It's a project that Robbie started last year, and we are super, super excited to have it back. And today we have a case presenter. Uh, let me know if I tell your name wrong. Uh, Shara, do you want yeah, to say Shares. hello? Hi. Introduce yourself. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm Shreyas. I went to medical school in India. Um, I graduated uh, and um, I, I, I love to participate in CP solvers. I, I just keep commenting all the time. And today I'm presenting a case, which I found was pretty interesting. And I learned a lot from it. So I thought I'll share it with all of you. Awesome. awesome. And um, go ahead. Go ahead, Deborah. No, yeah, awesome. Thank you for presenting your case for us. Yeah, sure. Um, so should I start or any? Yeah, our um, who's scri scribing? I think, I think Rishma signed up. Do we have Rishma here? It's it's me. Aisha that's scribing. Oh, Aisha scribing. Oh, sorry. Okay, Aisha, we can share the the whiteboard and take it away. Sharia's first aliqua. Sure. Uh, for the first aliqua. We have uh, a 42 year old man who presented with generalized yellowing of his skin and his eyes. Uh, he denies any other symptoms. He does not complain of any abdominal pain. There's no vomiting, diarrhea. Uh, there's been uh, no uh, chest pain or shortness of breath. And he also mentions that he does not have any recent travel history or any sick contacts. So his chief complaint is just generalized yellowing of his skin has been getting worse over the past three days. Oh, great start. So generalized yelling of the skin and eyes make me think about jaundice. And it's like a young patient, like 42 years old. And I listened like recently, um, if like young patients can have bad genes, bad luck or bad behavior. So maybe I want to know like more about the history of this patient, if this patient drink, of course, if this patient has any um, history in the family that could cause this jaundice, something in the liver. And Maddie adds to the chat like jaundice and hyperbilirubinemia. And I think like it's good for we make a difference because it's not the same like jaundice, it's like the, the manifestation and the hyperbilirubinemia is when the bilirubin is high and not all the times that the bilirubin is high can be generate jaundice. So it's it's a different and the jaundice is the, the, the clinical sign. And yeah, we can think about the causes, like if it's something therapeutic, like if could be an hemolysis that could be causing that, something hepatic, if it's something in, in the liver, like a cirrhosis, um, like um, hepatitis, any uh, drug toxicity, or could be like post hepatic, it could be like a thrombosis, something in the vein, and could be causing that jaundice. So yeah, like, I think we will need more information about this young male. What do you think, Ravi? Oh, Deborah, I'm just uh, sitting back and listening to previous VMRs just speak through you and all the things that I've learned through VMR on the ap approach to jaundice is just amazing. So uh, the time well spent attending VMRs, I can definitely tell that it's uh, that it's helped you in in organizing your thoughts and you've done a, just a, a marvelous representation of an approach to jaundice. And I can't help but also reference Maddie, who I always mention uh, does a spectacular job with jaundice. So when I heard that, I'm like, okay, Maddie should be in the lukewarm seat to discuss. But uh, yeah, I think just the journey through jaundice there, you've done a spectacular job. And what I would just add to that would be before that, if anybody, like like you just mentioned, a younger person coming in with jaundice, immediately I have to wor worry about, could this be, if I see this patient in the emergency room, I have to worry about acute liver failure. So patient that has encephalopathy. In the next aliquot, we may, um, I guess, Shreyas may disclose that the patient has 
altered mental status. Uh, coagulopathy also would also be something that could be very dangerous for a patient and it's something that could end up uh, um, having us transfer the patient to a, a liver transplant center. And the other thing would be if the patient patient has pre-existing liver issues. So if the patient had alcoholic liver injury, cirrhosis or anything like that, that might preclude them from um, a, a liver transplant. So if the patient doesn't meet criteria for acute liver injury, then we can start running the gamut of different causes. And we'd probably need to get more history to see if there's pre-existing liver disease, like you mentioned just eloquently, or hepatitis, if there's a history of hepatitis. Also, the liver enzymes will give us, a, uh, at least uh, help us pivot towards what could be going on. If we have liver enzymes that could be in the hundreds of, or in the thousands, it could be a number of different things. If it's in the 500s, then some common things. The age, which is interesting, you mentioned about the age, young patient, then there are other conditions that come in like PSE, PBC, for a male, PSC may be so the epidemiology may have some weight there. But before we dive deep into that, I kind of also want to mention that uh, prehepatic you mentioned. So you also have to worry about uh, like hemolytic disease. So when you have jaundice of the sclera, I guess the, u- the unit of measurement, I don't remember, about two and four would be where you see it in the skin. So this patient, you can say the, the bilirubin must be near four to five and so on. So it's, it's going to be pretty high. So I'm interested uh, to jump to the labs, but before that, let's get some more history. So back to you, Shreyas. Yeah, sure. Um, wonderful thoughts by Deborah and Dr. Singh. Um, this is exactly what we were thinking of as well. And uh, like you mentioned, it's important to get the enzymes for the liver. And uh, also you're talking about altered mental status to see if he has some sort of hepatic injury. Those are all some concerns. So now I'm going to move on to the second aliquot. Will I talk about his presentation in the ED and also about some of his past medical history. So uh, his past medical history is actually pretty unremarkable. He has no underlying medical conditions. He does not have any diabetes, hypertension, or dyslipidemias. And also he's not taking any medications. Uh, he's, He's not been on any medications whatsoever. But he does have past surgical history, which is significant because he underwent an appendectomy three weeks ago. And his appendectomy was successful and he was discharged home on antibiotics, which he took a 10 day course of. And apart from that, there's nothing else on his uh, past medical history and past surgical history. And in the ED, uh, with regards to his mental status, he was alert and oriented and he uh, he was not altered. So that's about his uh, presentation in the ED. And with regards to the social history, he does mention that uh, he drinks very socially, about two to three beers on the weekends sometimes, but not too much of alcohol. And he also mentions that uh, his he does not smoke cigarettes whatsoever, and he also does not use any drugs. Hmm. Quite quite a lot to cycle in your brain there, Deborah. But I'll I'll let you have. Um first stab at the the material that's presented. Yeah, um, just a quick question. He had any change like in the, in how he, he does the pee or the if he had any change on the stools or he, he doesn't mention any reference about that? Oh, no, but that's a wonderful question because we also asked him if he noticed any change in the color of his stools, if it was, you know, we were thinking about John, this like obstructive, like clay color. He mentions that he's not noticed it, uh, but we did ask him. He said he didn't notice anything, but it could have probably been there, but he didn't mention it. And even his uh, urine, he says it was uh, like it was always normally. He, did, he didn't notice any problem. Okay, perfect. So yeah, like uh, looking this past medical history, like this appendectomy, like I was thinking if maybe like, I don't know what medication he is on, like on the antibiotics, if that could be causing something in the liver. That was my first thought when I saw. And then like he said, drink two or three beers on the weekend. Sometimes like patients that drink a lot, we ask them, ah, do you drink? And they don't give us the right information because they lie for us and they want us to tell so maybe i would like tackle a little bit in that information like are you sure it's two and three just in the weekend or you drink something more Mm -hmm. and 
Uh, and yeah, he didn't mention any change on the on the P on the color. So I think I will investigate it a little bit more on these antibiotics and yeah, ask let him a, a few more questions. What what do you think, Ravi? I think uh, just honing in on the the events surrounding this this presentation. So three weeks ago, you're absolutely right. So we don't want to perform the bias of base rate neglect. So what uh, what will be common with this patient is we can have you know things like um, maybe uh, drugs, um, drugs meaning um, over the counter medications or uh, prescribed medications or any medications that were prescribed during the hospitalization and namely antibiotics. So yeah, we've had many antibiotic induced liver injury cases on VMR. And the most notorious one that I can probably recall off the top of my head is Augmentin. And uh, Bactrim could be, any any one of the beta lactams could be, but mo I think most notorious data-wise uh, is, is Augmentin for causing liver injury. And actually there was a recent case of my institution of Augmentin induced liver injury. So something that we can't help but see. When you are collecting history, you also want to ask about any herbal rem, uh, rem medications or remedies or anything that the patient could be taking, vitamin supplements. I even saw a case of uh, uh, protein supplements, whey protein-induced rhabdomyolysis and whey protein-induced liver injury. So anything could potentially cause uh, toxin-induced liver injury because it's filtered through the liver. And I think uh, that was a very, very good question you asked about the the urine, if it was dark, if it was clay-colored school stools, because that would highlight possible obstruction, right? So those would be definitely um, questions that you would go back and ask the patient to extract more relevant data to then focus in on um, hypothesis generation. So right now, our focus is likely within uh, the liver itself, so hepatocyte injury, uh, I guess less infectious at this point. I mean, if you look, somebody posted, I think Elena posted a really uh, complete differential of liver-induced injury, and uh, out of those, I think definitely drug would be highlighted, but we have to be careful that we're not being uh, swayed by this little piece of data, and there could be something else that's maybe adding a second layer to this patient. Again, be careful not to to perform base rate neglect and, and not focus in on the, the recent uh, hospitalization. But if we think about on, on another level, the, the appendectomy, could something have happened? The appendix is far down from the liver. So if you, um, during the surgery, perform uh, injury to the liver, but it is distal, right? So it's in the right lower quadrant versus the right upper quadrant. So less likely any sort of catastrophe happening during the surgery itself. So commonly in um, gallbladder surgery, there could be some nick of the, the common bile duct and leakage into the peritoneum causing sepsis. Uh, but I don't see anything like that happening. But um, anything else, Deborah, before we go back to Shreyas? No. Um... I'm curious for the vitals and tips for exam. Sure. Um, so in the ED, his physical exam was actually pretty normal. He, he had a heart rate of 66 per minute. Uh, his blood pressure was 132 over 80. Respiratory rate was 13 per minute. And he was uh, saturating 99% on room air. Uh, his physical exam was also, uh, he was alert and oriented times four. Uh, his uh, general, his uh, abdominal exam, he was... Uh, non-tender and it was uh, it was non-distended and he was it was generally soft to palpation there was no rebound rigidity or guarding uh but on the general exam he he was visibly yellow in color he had uh, yellowish discoloration of his face of his clera and also his palms and his trunk so that was the only thing which was noticeable uh, his uh, uh EHNAC ENT exam was also within normal limits. The cardiovascular exam, his heart sounds were S1, S2 was heard. There was no additional heart sounds. And his pulmonary exam was also within normal limits with no additional uh, adventitious breath sounds. And also, I forgot to mention, uh, his abdominal exam, there was no evidence of any hepatomegaly or splenomegaly as well. Mm. What do you think, Deborah? Yeah, like the 
starting with the vital seems like everything normal and going for the John does seems like he has like a lot of parts of his body like um that can mani manifestated with the yellow chip uh, more than I was expecting. And he has no hepatosplenomegaly, something that I was wor worried about it. it could, he could have something in the liver that could be more chronic that could cause like a, a splenomag uh, hepatosplenomegaly. So yeah, like here, just confirm a little bit the information that we had. I think I, I will go for the lab. That's what I'm, I'm yeah. thinking. Like, what, what, what do you think, Ravi? I actually right behind you there. I think the so the so now what does the the exam do for us? So I think it also negates the the likelihood of chronic liver disease. So we're not looking. We're not. Or sorry, we're, we're looking for, but we're not seeing stigmata of liver injury. And then Maddie just duly mentioned that patients hemodynamically stable and uh just other things that i've seen users mentioned yeah the the theory and we'll go we'll revisit the theory about the surgery it's still early it's 116 so we have room to sort of stop and sort of uh, make a meaningful med mental representation of this problem here so something not to look over but uh in in chronic liver injury and cirrhosis you tend to have lower blood pressures maybe and then you do find um abnormal exam findings, maybe protuberant abdomen in a neurotic patient, spider angiomata as well. And um, we do have the jaundice, uh, although with this patient, but I think the labs will help us. In acute viral hepatitis, we do get an elevated uh, bilirubin as well like this. It will be a purely hepatocellular process. Somebody also mentioned that uh, unlikely a post-hepatic obstructive process uh, currently, uh, that is, that's a play. But again, the labs will help us. But let's do this since it's early. Uh, we can do breakout rooms. Once we get the labs, we'll kind of stop, and then we'll do breakout rooms and let people sort of uh, think about the labs and how it helps them pivot to the diagnosis. But just revisiting that last piece about the, again, Yusuf had mentioned about the... Yusuf, you want to unmute for a second? Uh, I, I'm also dwelling on this this surgery, when you have a procedure, a lot of times you you can't just look over a procedure. You have to rev you have to visit procedure related complications. What goes through your mind when you're thinking about the the remoteness of the procedure and this presentation? Because the, there's a saying that says when you hear hoof, ba hoof beats, think horses, not zebras. So in a young patient who just had a surgery, I have to wonder if this is related to the procedure or the medications related to it. So uh, in the uh, a surgery like an appendectomy, I wonder, one, if there was a rupture, what was the indication for the appendectomy? Two, is there a leak post-op that feeded the, the abdomen causing like, an abscess or something related in the abdomen as well? And then thirdly, I just wonder if the diagnosis of uh, appendicitis was that the reason for the surgery or not, and just making me think of the background of the patient as well. One thing I also think of is did the patient receive any blood transfusions? Because that could also put them at risk of hepatitis, although that's also very, very low in modern day uh, blood banks. Awesome overview. I really do appreciate that. And again, this is kind of, we have the luxury of time so we can uh, ask the crowd for any input, but um I think what's what's intriguing is the patient is quite stable. There's no whiff of an infection from the vital signs, although the labs will disclose that. And as far as the what's interesting, what you just picked up on and the conference you just went to, the Society to Improve uh, Diagnosis in in Medicine, uh, many times patients come with uh, ab, no, ab I would say uh, a. a, a like an abdominal presentation, which people can't explain. And on radiological imaging, there's some abnormality found with the appendix and a lot of patients undergo append appendectomies, right? Which they think will solve the problem, but it ends up being that there's something in the background that's sort of brewing. And on, on a second look, they may actually be disclosed. So that sometimes is what we call a convenient diagnosis uh, and, you, and it can cause rush to judgment and appendectomies are often performed, but they're not the cause of the patient's presentation. So in this case, you have to ask when the patient presented, was it a true append appendicitis or was it just removed 
to alleviate the patient's problem. So that that's something that's a very important and powerful question that comes through. So we'll go back to Shreyas and after the labs, we'll I'll, I'll set up some break breakout rooms and we can discuss further. Back to you, Shreyas. Sure. Uh, so his labs, uh, his uh, CBC, he had a WBC of 7,000, hemoglobin of 14, platelets of 150,000. His uh, sodium was 130, 136, potassium was 3.5, chloride was 106, bicarbonate was 23, BUN was 11, creatinine, creatinine was 0.6, uh, I'm, I don't have the glucose with me, but the calcium was uh, 9.3 and magnesium was 1.6. And on presentation, his AST was 62 and ALT was 63. And ALKFAST was 600. And his total bilirubin was 20. Direct was 16.8 and indirect was 3.2. I don't have his GFR with me uh, and the troponin was, uh, we didn't check for the troponin for this patient. Fascinating. That totally turns the case on its head. I was anticipating um, something more different, but uh, let's go to breakout rooms and... Um, Let's see. Okay. okay. Stop. Let's start. Okay, so I, I kind of did a round robin of all the rooms, and I think in room one, I heard Gregory, if... Gregory's here. He's mentioning some interesting thoughts. Are you able to unmute your mic and, and share with us, yep. Gregory, what you were thinking? Yes. I think we lost you there. If not, was there anybody else in? I think Gregory's connection is lost there, but anybody else in room one? If not, we can move on to room two. Room two, I was hearing David. Um, uh, I can go, Ravi. Um, okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so we spoke about different, um, basically, we, we spoke mainly about culprits being maybe meds or exposure to um, um, other meds, including um, the ones he was discharged on, or maybe like details about the operation um, during anesthesia and exposure to meds during that time. Um, we also had um, thoughts about um, basically um, whether the surgery was laparoscopic or appendectomy, or basically um, open appendectomy. Uh, just for the possibility of further complications, or I heard some some of the speakers were talking about hematoma compressing the um, bile ducts, which was interesting for me. And um, yeah, if I'm, I think if I'm not missing anything, maybe Shreyas would um, add more. Oh, that was a great thought. I really like the the thought of linking the surgical complications with obstruction that we're seeing. Uh, the the pan that we're seeing within the lab. Sorry there, Gregory. We we um, couldn't hear you. Are you able to meet your mic? Any anything else uh, you want to share? Is this your first time logging on? I haven't seen you before. Uh, this is my third time. But I think the previous two meetings you weren't here. <laughs> That's just the past two days. I think my first time was on Sunday. Right. So I was uh, basically talking about the complication from the surgery. So possibly the appendix was uh, could have been a bit higher up. And then during the appendectomy, the biliary tree, the common biliary ducts could have been licked. And then thus we get the post-surgery, we get the um, obstructive jaundice picture because of the ALP and then the GGT elevation. So yeah, those are my thoughts. Awesome. Uh, where are you logging in from, Gregory? Accra, Ghana. 
Oh, awesome. Welcome. Great to have you on. And then thank in, you. Uh, thank you for and then moving on to room two, uh, we had I think it was David. Hi everyone. Um we were also commenting on on the possible uh, ways in which uh, the surgery could lead to to um cholestasis. Uh, and it was mentioned that uh, TPN uh, you, after surgery or uh, in a in complicated surgery could could lead to, to cholestasis. And I was uh, also thinking uh, if um, I, we think in this case will definitely uh, need some, some imaging, uh, especially in the US or RCT, but um, how can we uh, make progress towards intrahepatic or, or exahepatic uh, cause of cholestasis here with the information we just have? Um, and I'm not sure, uh, we were not sure, but uh, trying to, to think if uh, the absence of symptoms could point uh, more towards an um, intrahepatic than extrahepatic cause. Uh, extrahepatic are more uh, common, and when they develop acutely, tend to uh, cause also elevation in, in AFP or ALP. Uh, but it's mm, more so acute as we seem to be here. And um, it's I don't know if they could also. Because uh, 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 more elevation in, in um, and the other thing uh, is the uh, I don't know just a question for for you um, is the degree of elevation uh, because it's twenty uh, of uh, total bilirubins here uh, it could point more towards uh, intra or extra I, I I don't know uh, if. Mm, that could be a clue because I've, I've seen such a degree only with uh, uh, extrahepatic uh, causes such as um, uh, pancreatic cancer or something like that. But uh, I think maybe the, the clinical causes more, more, um, will make us more thinking in something such as uh, amoxicillin, flavonoid, toxicity if the patient receives it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great thought there. That if it's um, intrahepatic or extrahepatic, we'll, we'll table that for now. We'll we'll discuss it afterwards. Uh, I think I want to uh, move to room three, and we'll ask our good friend who we haven't seen for a while, Mukund, if you're able to share your thoughts. If you're in a safe space to to share your thoughts, long time we haven't heard from you. Yeah, it's great to be back. I'm on my third year right now, so I squeeze squeeze my days off where I can. Um, super fun. Uh, we had a really good discussion, uh, lots of great thoughts. I think personally, I'm still thinking about the uh, the acuity of the time course. Uh, it's direct hyperbilirubinemia. The AST and the ALT are slightly elevated, likely secondary to cholestasis, given the sky high alpha and phosphatase. Uh, and we talked about this R factor, the ratio between the ALT and the ALP being less than two indicating an extra hepatic cause of jaundice most likely. Um, and I'm still really focused, uh, you know, in the absence of zebra type thinking on this procedure. So the appendectomy three weeks ago um, with the meds that he took afterwards, you know, could implicate drug-induced cholestasis, could implicate opiate-induced sphincter of OD dysfunction causing an extra hepatic kind of cholestatic picture. Um, although I think you'd, you'd probably see some pancreatic involvement in that case. Uh, PSC, PBC, autoimmune phenomena, I think possible, but less likely given the acuity of the time course. I'm more familiar with those being a subacute to chronic process uh, and then direct effects of the surgery. So, you know, the appendix and the gallbladder and some people aren't that far away from each other. If you're thinking about post-surgical adhesions affecting the extra hepatic biliary tree, if you're thinking about surgical accidents and lacerations to the cystic duct or to the common bile duct, um, and then I was reading this paper also that was talking about hyperbilirubinemia as a predictor of acute appendicitis, um, and that is commonly seen as elevated in, in acute appendicitis patients with a sensitivity of something like 70%, according to this paper. I don't suspect that it gets up to the 20s, uh, just because of appendiceal inflammation, but it's something to think about as a contributor. 
Wow, Mukun, so, such powerful thoughts there. And I think that just elevates the group think exercise that we currently have in, in process here. And a couple of interesting things that you brought up. So we'll, we'll also discuss that in a bit. And then um, in the last group, I was able to listen in on Aryaban. I think it was somebody who I haven't heard from before. If you're in a safe space. Um, oh, sorry, Arya who? If you're able to unmute and share your thoughts, uh, you're actually commenting on uh, a couple of interesting things. Oh, hello. Hello, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, where um, are you logging so, in from? Oh, I'm logging from uh, Toronto. Oh, awesome, awesome. Go ahead. So, um, yes, so, so I was considering um, the overall picture um, for the patient, I mean, since he um, isn't um, um, he's he appears clinically stable, um, and looking at the um, the DLF, LFT, they seem more like a um, polystatic picture. So, um, also thinking about um, the drugs that he could have um, been on post surgery that could uh, complicate um, uh cause a picture as that but um other than that i i'm just uh thinking along that line absolutely yeah uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts there so this this was a phenomenal group uh think exercise i think it definitely a couple of thoughts crossed my mind when listening to all of you so it was such a powerful discussion all of you collectively put together deborah what do you what do you take away from this and how does this move it forward? Or could you summarize all the thoughts together to think, what do you think is possibly going on and what should be the next step for this patient? Yeah, we had a lot of good thoughts. I really like the one from Gregory talking about to be a complication from the surgery and, and causing an hematoma. And that was something that I was not thinking. And I think now we will need some image. I think we can get like a, an ultrasound or a CT of the liver. And some people ask about the GGT and was elevated. So I don't know if any more labs we could, we could order, but yeah, I think I, I want imaging now. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Oh yeah, Shreyas, yeah. Um, I guess next Alicot, if you have any imaging, definitely that definitely. would help move the needle forward. Yeah, I have some more labs and uh, imaging, and I'm going to be discussing that in this uh, aliquot. Um, like everyone was mentioning, it could also be because of the intrahepatic cholestasis pattern. And so GGT was elevated for this patient. I want to mention that. And his haptoglobin level was normal at 55. And we also got hepatitis serology for this patient. The only thing which was positive was the anti-hepatitis B surface antibody. Um, the, the rest of the hepatitis serology was negative for him. And we also got a serum seroloplasmin level, which was also within normal limits. Uh, so that's the labs which we have for now. And we have imaging. Uh, uh, when he was in the ER, he was immediately taken and an ultrasound was done to see if there was any... Uh, obstruction and the ultrasound abdomen it just showed increased liver echogenicity which was consistent with fatty liver disease uh, and in the gallbladder we also know there was a biliary sludge and uh, gallstones and but then the radiological murphy sign was negative and he also had a non-dilated common bile duct at 4.3 millimeters and the the rest of the imaging, the ultrasound imaging for the rest of the organs, the kidneys and spleen was all within normal limits. And we also had a CT scan done for him. Although I don't have the exact details of the CT scan with me at this moment, it was normal. There was no masses or any lesions. Uh, um, and there was no any, um, there was no pancreatitis or uh, gallbladder uh, wall thickening, none of that on CT scan. So CT was within normal limits. There was no malignancies or masses. And we also got some of the serology for him with regards to the ANA. ANA was negative and the anti-mitochondrial antibody was also negative. The anti-smooth muscle antibody was negative. And we got a TSH for him, which was 1.3 micro units per milliliter. 
And there was also concern whether the gallstones which were seen on ultrasound could be uh, gallstones causing possibly a ball valve effect and uh, causing his um, direct bilirubin to go up. So, and we wanted to just make sure that the CBD which was on ultrasound was not a false test. We wanted to see whether it was really dilated and even got an MRCP which did not show uh, any CBD dilatation and there was no stone or uh, there was, uh, I'm sorry, there was no common bile duct stone. Yeah. Very interesting. I don't know about what you think, Edebra, but this, uh, I think Anmol Preet had mentioned in the chat, this excludes a lot of different competing hypotheses that we had at the get-go. So, but it does this clarify our uh, thinking at this point? I think it does. We kind of have to remove a lot of the different things, but I'm going to focus back to ALP. A lot of the anatomy is normal, right? The CBD was normal, uh, Shreyas. I think the size. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was the CBD was not dilated. I'm sorry. Not dilated. Have, um, so, yeah. So then, our initial hypothesis was dwelling around intrapatic and extrapatic. So. When we see, well, when we when we hear about ALP, we always think about biliary ductal dil dilatation, but the biliary ducts in the in the liver itself can also be obstructed. They could be squashed by ballooning hepatocytes. They could be biliary stasis, as somebody mentioned. Sepsis can cause it. Drugs can cause it as well. But usually, the most common symptoms that you get, along with intrahepatic cholestasis, usually if your patient will be fatigued. You have pruritus, which this patient doesn't have. Uh, the GDT was interesting. Aisha had mentioned it earlier. That uh, was, I think, ele elevated. But we know there's something going on within the liver, and this is not from bone. But I think um, another parameter that you could do is a five nucleotidase. Uh, it used to be, theoretically, it used to be included in textbooks, but I don't think we do it anymore. But there's usually ALP, five nucleotidase, and GGT, uh, that's done. And if those are normal, then it's a non-hepatic source. But in this case, we definitely have hepatobiliary disease. So how can this be, how can we sort of use this to leverage a, a, a particular cause? I'm thinking here, something is going on in the liver. There's some echogenicity within the liver, the, the biliary sludge. Uh, I doubt that it's causing any issues, um, but it's something still to put on the back burner as a potential cause, or it could be an outlier as well. But infiltrative is interesting. ALP can be elevated in uh, infiltrative disorders such as granulomatous disease, parasitic disease, or any malignancy that's taking up real estate within the liver. So you have to kind of think about that, but we're not getting any signature extrapatically. So we're not getting any other systemic sort of involvement uh, with these sort of conditions. The stricture was something, I think that was a competing thought from the surgery. And as people had astutely mentioned, the surgery was performed for we don't know why. Was it a real appendicitis that required um, surgery or was there something else that was neglected? And that's what's causing this return visit for this patient. So right now I'm, I am interested in the liver, MRCP, all the diagnostic testing is done. And then autoimmune has been ruled out. That's, so that's off the table. What do you think, Deborah? Yeah, I was, I, as everything was ruled out, I was thinking, okay, what, what we can think about now? And yes, it's like a great thought in the chat about something that could be like an ascarosis. It could be something like AIDS. So that gives me a light in the end of the tunnel, like thinking if the patient could have something like this. Um, but yeah, and, and even like autoimmune disease can have like some antibodies negative. So sometimes like that doesn't throw out a, a, an autoimmune disease. Um, but I'm, I'm asking myself what, what we should order for this patient now? What, what do you think, Ravi? Yeah, the only other thing, the testing I can think about is liver biopsy, but that's very invasive. And is that high value care, right? So high value care, is it going to get you to the diagnosis and nothing else will help you? And is it is very invasive. And because the the, the liver is uh, highly perfused, is a very friable org, uh, organ, uh, there can be bleeding that can happen and, and complications from it. So 
we kind of have to wonder, all the autoimmune workups, negative, the liver enzymes aren't elevated unless the liver enzymes elevate during the hospital stay. So again, patients are dynamic sort of in their in their presentation at the index point when they arrive, the liver enzymes may be normal, but then five days in, they could be elevated and we could have the picture of uh, drug-induced liver injury. So I'm kind of interested to see what next, what happened, Shreyas. Sure. Um, so David is mentioning in the comments that I've been hiding the antibiotic for long enough now. So yeah, <laughs> we had all of these tests done. We had uh, we had all of these uh, MRCP and the ANA, everything was negative. And um, like Dr. Singh mentioned, I think five minutes into the discussion, uh, we, we we went and we dug out which antibiotic he'd taken. And I just wanted to ask uh, everyone, all the discussions, any guesses as to which antibiotic he was taking? Oh yeah, a lot of people have it in the comments. Yes, <laughs> it was actually augmentin induced uh, cholestasis. So that was uh, the what we actually came up with. And uh, uh, his uh, ALP kept was fluctuating all the time. He had taken, and the, the reason this was so surprising was that he had taken it like almost two weeks back and it was showing up now. And um, that was actually something which was very interesting. And then we went and looked at his drug chart and he was discharged on a 10-day course of augmentin and he'd taken that. And over the two weeks course, he slowly started developing cholestasis and um, that was the ultimate diagnosis. Although we also had uh, uh, the, the vanishing bile duct syndrome on the differential diagnosis, but then uh, we would expect the uh, ALP to keep getting elevated all the time and not uh, drop. But I, I, I didn't see the patient after this after 20 or 30 days, his ALP started going down. So we could attribute the uh, cholestasis to augmentin. Wow, incredible. Yeah, it, it's it's so interesting. I usually would look for the cases that I've encountered with augmentin-induced liver injury. The liver enzymes are thousands, like 5,000, like high. In this case, they're like, they're low. I have to research, but do you have any, any teaching points regarding augmentin and it's a mechanism of liver injury. Why in this case would it be just the ALP versus the AST LTE elevation? Um, that's actually something which is very interesting and I was actually reading up on. Uh, it's actually very unclear. Uh, and uh, augment in, I was reading up about augment in India's um, drug induced liver injury after I encountered this case. And I read that the time course is actually very variable and there is... Uh, it depends on many things like CYP metabolism of the drug. It depends on HLA susceptibility. So some people have HLA, I believe it's B5701, and that makes them more susceptible to develop this uh, cholestatic pattern. And it's very unclear. Some people, even when they are taking the drug, the ALP tends to go down. But for some people, they take the they take augmentin, and then after two weeks or three weeks, like it was in my patient, um, they start developing the rise in ALP. So it's actually extremely variable as to why this happens. And also, uh, I also read up that uh, augment it's uh, amoxicillin versus amoxicillin clavulin. It when you compare them. Uh, it's more amoxicillin clavulin. It's more of augmentin rather than amoxicillin. There's, so there's something about the clavulinic acid part, which uh, also has a beta lactam ring, which uh, predisposes people to develop uh, the cholestasis. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but that I, I was reading a study and actually uh, made a document which I'm which I will share in the chat about this, and I linked some papers, and that's interesting to go through as well. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It is more of a cholestatic picture than hepatocellular. So there's no injury directly to the hepatocytes and lysis of hepatocytes causing AST, LT elevation. So really appreciate you bringing this case. Uh, Deborah, you you were absolutely amazing. Like starting off, I could have just sat back and you just kind of ran the whole spectrum of liver diseases. What, what do you think about today's case? Whoa, what a case. I'm so glad that you were, we were together, Ravi, for you saved me to, on this complicated case. I never had seen um, this diagnosis, so it's something that I will have definitely to read about it. And yeah, thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing this amazing case. We 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 love we love to learn with what you you show it for us, and we cannot wait to for we continue uh, discussing your cases. And thank you everyone in the chat that really helped it and everyone was on fire.
Sure. And all of you had augment in the first thing I mentioned. So everyone got the answer like five minutes into the case. That's wonderful. Yeah. And uh, that's interesting. Just like a minute spent on when we do these cases, people worry about it. They ask me like, will they get it in the first aliquot? That's not the whole goal of this. People may get it, but we had no idea. It was just a thought, but we weren't committing to that diagnosis. But look at the spectrum of different diseases that we went through. Look at the journey that your case had had uh, stimulated. So amazing. And the chat was on fire and people in the breakout rooms had great discussion. So I really appreciate uh, you bringing this and teaching us a, a lot about liver disease. So we'll move on to the, the teaching points. And I think Rishma has the teaching points today. Hi, everyone. It was an amazing case. And I personally have never heard of a uh, augmented in, uh, induced uh, cholestasis. So it was super, super new to me. And I enjoyed learning from this case. Um, so a uh, quick summary of the preaching points. So when a patient has jaundice, um, etiologies could be prehepatic, intrahepatic, and posthepatic. In a young patient, we can consider PVC and PSC as a con uh, as a cause of hyperbilirubinemia. anemia. Um, antibiotics could contribute to um, LFT elevation, especially augmentin or any other beta lactam, as we saw in this case. Um, so before we derive anything from the LFTs, we can act. We should actually look at the patient's basal level of LFTs. Um, before we are able to conclusion. So if surgery, um, gallbladder surgery could cause biliary leakage and sepsis, which should be taken into consideration considering um, hyperbilirubinemia anemia in a post-surgical patient. So um, Yusuf brought in an amazing point where he said, when you hear hoof beats, think of horses and not zebras. So we should make sure we take uh, a good look at the recent procedures, the treatment that's given during the procedures and after the procedure, um, and also like post-surgical transfusion when we think of like the patient's presentation. Um, so um, so surgery, a laparoscopic surgery could cause a hematoma that could compress the bile duct and cause obstructive jaundice. Um, even ex like not just extrahepatic, intrahepatic causes could also cause direct bilirubin elevation. Opioids, even after surgery for pain, could cause or sphincter of con contraction, causing an extrahepatic cholestasis picture. Um, Post-surgical adhesions and intrahepatic trauma uh, during the surgery could also cause um, increased bilirubinemia. Um, and um, hyperbilirubinemia is a valuable marker for acute appendicitis. Shreyas gave a, a beautiful article that showed this. So what we learned from this article is that bilirubin should be included in the assessment of patients with suspected appendicitis. Um, so fine nucleotidase, ALP and GGT, um, so this could be elevated uh, in a patient with hyperbilirubinemia. If it's normal, it could be a non-hepatic source of hyperbilirubinemia. And um, so the final uh, diagnosis was uh, augmentin. And causing cholestasis and sometimes acute li uh, sometimes liver injury. And Shreyas told us that, uh, that it's in augmentin, namoxicillin, clavulinate. It's the clavulinate that causes, more, that's more, co contributes more to the hyperbilirubemia than just the amoxicillin. So um, clavulin is also being a beta lactam. It could be like Dr. Kunkun said, uh, it could be the beta lactams contributing. Um, so it could uh, the this the patient this presentation could be seen even after a significant time of two weeks after the drug has been taken and then been stopped. Um, so with this presentation, vanishing bile duct could, syndrome could also be a differential, and um, augmentin could cause acute liver injury and cholestasis or even just cholestasis with just the elevation of ALPs without alkphos without elevation of any other liver enzymes. So this, these are the teaching points for today. Thank you so much, Rashma, and thank you everyone for being here with us. Um, I hope to see you all tomorrow on another VMR. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.